hello and welcome to Forbidden Talk, a series dedicated to exploring sensitive social issues in the Middle East. This week we shall be discussing censorship and freedom of expression in the arts. Edith Wharton once said that art is on the side of the oppressed and some would say that the statement most exemplifies the happenings in the Middle East when it comes to the creative arts. There have been several defining moments over the last 10 years in film, art, theatre, music and literature, all depicting the real truth of life in the Middle East through underground movements. Today we shall be exploring whether it's the restrictions of freedom that ignite the creative process, as well as the various contradictions and myths surrounding censorship and the arts in the Middle East. As ever, we are discussing these themes with an array of experts, and at this point I'd like to introduce my studio guests, Rose Issa, curator, writer and producer who has championed visual art and film from the Middle East for more than 30 years, and Nathaniel Manone, an academic at SOAS University who is currently working on his doctorate entitled Between Descent and Co-Optation, an exploration of film, music and quotidian humour in revolutionary Tunisia. Welcome both of you on the show. Thank you. But before we, we move on, let's take a look at this brief report. The underground art movement has gained popularity in recent years throughout the Middle East, especially since the Arab Spring. Whether it be through graffiti, hip-hop or films, people, and especially the youth, have found various different outlets to express themselves. The art of graffiti became widespread in Egypt in the wake of the Arab Spring, with artists taking to walls of government buildings, police barricades and people's houses across the country to offer their uncensored political and social views. The Swiss Embassy in Cairo even invited artists to redesign its walls in a show of cultural cooperation. But last month, Egypt's custom services in Alexandria seized 400 copies of Wars of Freedom, a book depicting Egypt's street graffiti art in the context of the 2011 uprising on the grounds that the book instigated revolt. In Syria's uprising, a new generation of underground dissident artists, writers and thinkers emerged, a movement that gained international recognition for its aesthetics of resistance. Rather than picking up guns, these artists picked up spray paint, cameras, pen, ink and digital illustration to express their interpretation of the war. In Tunisia, the birthplace of the Arab Spring, hip-hop arts have spread rapidly amongst youth in post-revolution Tunisia as a means of blowing off steam in an environment of broken promises and a weak economy. But with Egypt stepping up its crackdown on underground arts, will it only be a matter of time for others to follow suit? Rose, do you think censorship is a fuel for creativity? It could be. Censorship could be a fuel for creativity, but not always. I mean, we have uh, since Orson Welles in The Third Man, where he said, you know, with 500 years of repression in Italy, they had Renaissance Michelangelo and so on. And with uh, 500 years of peace in Switzerland, they only have the cuckoo clock. <laughs> So, of course, it could be, but it shouldn't be the reason for it. And I think if an artist, uh, the artists usually express what they have to say. Uh, I always quote a great uh, a Persian poet, Rumi, Jalaluddin Rumi, who said, whatever comes, comes from a need, a sore distress, a hurting want. So I, I think repressions and censorship is not very specified in our time. We always will live during censorship time. We don't, I mean, coming from Middle East, I know very well that America is not as, as democratic. The word democratic doesn't mean much to us because it's not as democratic when uh, Netanyahu, who is a war criminal, gets 17 standing ovation. So it's, for me, uh, um, censorship, if you, and however, you cannot criticize in America with all of this democratic media and, I don't know, 200 channels, you cannot criticize if something goes wrong in Israel, for example, but you can criticize very easily in, in Europe. You know, everybody now says, I'm Charlie. I don't feel I sing, I feel I'm Fatma, even if I'm not neither a Muslim nor... Uh, anyhow, it's, it's, well, it's an issue. Yeah. It's an issue. But censorship for me always existed. But I think the best works have nothing to do with censorship. The best works have to do with the need of expression and with the talent of the artist. Uh, the, the images you showed us uh, a few minutes ago are wonderful pictures of you know, street art in Cairo. I think at the moment, almost in, in 30 years, 40 years I have been traveling to Cairo, these are some of the best works I have seen uh, among Cairo artists. Yes, right now. It, they are, yes, excellent. Okay. The, the but street why is art. That? 
because I think people are doing it sincerely, out of truth, because they, they feel that you know the street is theirs. They don't need the gallery. They are not doing it for money. They are not doing for before before the revolution. Most of the gallery belonged to the officialdom, you know, the the censors were the government and so on. And now nobody can control. In fact, the government doesn't give a damn for, about the artist. So post censorship, and, art has become better. Uh, yeah, no, they are just expressing it and they are not catering for a market. I think they are catering, they just want to say what they have to say and it's fantastic. Nathaniel, what do you, what do you have to say? Because you, you know Egypt in depth actually, the street scene and street art. My expertise is more on Tunisia, but okay. I would say, I, I have to agree with Rose, that it's, it's yes and no. Um, it can hamper the efforts of, of, of artists in, in pursuing their craft, however, that it can also be a consecrating function. By that I mean uh, Aziza Mami, a Tunisian blogger, said that if a blogger wasn't blocked, wasn't censored before the revolution, um, well, when he was, Tunisians knew he was telling the truth. Um, it, this manifests itself in, in several different areas, but it can result in exactly the situation that um, a given government has sought to avoid. Um, if we accept the premise, for instance, just to give a, a, an example outside of the Middle East, if we accept that North Korea did in fact do the Sony uh, hack, for instance, that was the best PR and marketing move for that film that could have happened. It went from being a film that very few people would have gone to watch to something that some Americans were saying it was their civic duty to go watch. Yeah, so something censored uh, becomes intriguing for people and, and a good form of PR, as you say. Well, there is a, I've spoken to several Tunisian artists about the cyclical nature between censorship and curiosity. And a caricature artist, Nidal Gariani, he, he told me, um, in, in a rather happy way of putting it, he referred to the movie Seven, the American film Seven, and he said, it's exactly like that movie. What's in the box, man? <laughs> um, <laughs> Highly appropriate, I think. <laughs> so, um, Rose, you've championed many artists from the Middle East over the years. What sort of challenges have they come across? I think challenges are, as I said, always existed. For example, we were talking of censorship. But uh, it's not the censorship. It's by reflecting the reality that the, that the censors are worried about. It's not what they, they, the rules that can be trans, transgressed. For example, I would take somebody who is at the moment in house arrest, Jafar Panahi, a filmmaker mm -hmm. who had had several awards in many festivals internationally. Jafar Panahi did a film called Crimson Gold, uh, Taloi mm -hmm. And in it, he showed a scene, a very short scene of uh, Pastoran, um, moral uh, self-appointed police, stopping people coming out of a party, women, men, and telling them, are you married? Is that your brother? And so on and so forth. He reflects exactly what it happens in Tehran. People usually wait outside the door, catch up people after the party, check if they are drunk, if there is loud music, etc. And the, um, the government asked him to take it out. He said, but I reflect. You should be very happy that I reflect. It's you who are arresting it. So it is a very good thing to arrest people. <laughs> don't you think so? So he was reflecting a reality. He said, if you don't want me to reflect what you agree on, then you should change the rules. But right. I'm just reflecting. I'm a social uh, filmmaker, and I reflect your rules and your rank. What's wrong? But they insisted. And in fact, the more they insisted, the more people knew, OK, they know this is wrong and they want to take it out. So they have to solve that problem. So in some ways, very, with lots of talent, with lots of subtlety, I would say, he reflected all this crisis that you know, people make fun of. Of course, that the young people who are arrested don't make fun because they have to go and take a few beatings or pay money or you know, cater for, for, for supposedly the illegal way of having parties and so on. So the authorities are threatened mostly of the truth. Yes, and the, the truth reality. that they, they, they themselves imposed. I mean, they are the ones who are arresting people coming out of the parties. Nathalia, what would you say to that, the truth that they imposed? I would say it's, it's not just truth, but in a more general sense, any form of art that refutes the image which they wish to put forward. Because there's, I think it's important to remember that the image that they're putting forward and the arts that they sponsor and the, the patronage networks, that the, the image that they promote abroad, the pamphlets they put out through their embassies in different languages, any form of art that refutes that jeopardizes financial rents. It can jeopardize trade deals. 
Um, so it, it expands beyond the art realm. But do governments really promote art? I never saw any embassy doing any exhibition of value uh, personally from the Middle East, neither the Iranian embassy nor any of the Arab not embassies. Not even propaganda? No, not even propaganda. They cannot. I know at some stage even the foreign office here wanted to be very nice. British Council was trying to. And they said, oh, would you rose exhibit so and so? I said, no, he's rubbish. Why should I exhibit so and so? He said, but that can please the government. I said, why should I please the government or anyone, nor you, nor British Council, nor the government? My job is to find talents and to find what reflects the current concern, whether aesthetic, conceptual, uh, socio-political of the artists uh, who reflect our uh, our concerns, My, the other people's concern. It, but I never saw really a proper any any good exhibition by any government sponsored, mm -hmm. at least from the Middle East. Now British Council, of course, British government or American government have their own way of sponsoring uh, their exhibition, which is of the quality of the artists they have, and so. But they have an infrastructure. We don't have much of an infrastructure to promote. Are you talking about films that are sponsored by a Tunisian government, let's say, or Egyptian can be. government? Can be. Yeah. They never travel. Those films don't travel. I cannot uh, uh, really. Their language is another language. It's not an art language. I I tried very well to say, okay, let me bring some popular films that are that people see in the festivals in Tehran or in Cairo or in Tunis, and I bring. It doesn't translate. We cannot. There isn't a public for it. They don't get mm -hmm. it. Because the jokes are inner jokes, the things are, even some who are sort of even critical, subsidized by the government, who are critical of some aspect of the government, corrupt mullahs or so and so. But those films don't travel. I don't think they communicate with the general public. Well, I think patronage of the arts done by states um, can, in effect, I mean, it, it operates as the other side of the coin. You have censorship, you have outright coercion, but there's also patronage. They can patronize the arts that might not, as you said, be good or that might not travel or conversely, as we've seen, as they're referred to as Syrian cave films, films that are sponsored and sent abroad but are not necessarily. Uh, artist is different. Artist has to express what he is interested in and not be bought and sold. Uh, but there are lots of uh, lots of films uh, so that there's are a difference. the governments okay. in, in, in Egypt or in Iran do sponsor uh, films. But as I said, uh, frankly, it's very, very difficult to put them in international film festivals. It is not because uh, we like arty films, because in some ways the communication is not a universal communication. People don't feel that the concerns that are reflected there can be human concerns. They are just propagandist concerns or popular concerns, but not, uh, I find very difficult. I really saw a lot of films in my life and I couldn't select the mainstream pro-governmental things that were patronage. And, and they take it and they have the funds to go to Cannes, to elsewhere, to distribute, to, sh to show, they fund the exhibition, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so sometimes they do travel under the embassy or some curators from the States who come to Iran, stays for, for free in hotel for a month and a half, then takes the artwork that the museums or in Egypt or the, you know, in America, Metropolitan at one stage, because they wanted to borrow some works from Pharaonic, had to exhibit the Minister of Culture's work, paintings, that nobody would exhibit otherwise. But they had Farouk Hosni's uh, work were exhibited in the Metro. This is something I would not do, and yet Metropolitan did. So I was shocked that the American Museum accept condition that even a nobody like me does not accept okay. in terms of pressure. Well, at this point, I'd like to uh, welcome my Skype guest. From Madrid is Jake Threadgould, anthropologist and photographer, who has traveled to Iran and documented various clandestine spaces. Jake, can you tell us why you decided to travel to Iran and explore the underground movements? Um, initially, I was in Iraqi Kurdistan, and I met a lot of people traveling to and from Iran who told me to go, so it was almost on a whim. I didn't go explicitly with the intention of um, investigating these underground cultures, although when I do travel I constantly write and photograph. And being a Westerner, I was approached a lot by um, people who would almost invite me into these little spaces of um, freedom. Um, so I was able to kind of absorb some of, uh, some of the culture that was in there. I think the same thing happened there. And what sort of underground happenings did you come across? Um, a lot of it was social. Um, so. I went to parties in Tehran that would have been illegal if anybody knew about them. Um, 
and it, it ranged from um, the very minor kind of little um, acts of rebellion to the quite severe acts of rebellion. Um, so something as simple as um, um, an old man I met who had a picture of, a, of the Shah, the last Shah, on his mobile phone. Um, or parties that were catered towards the LGBT, uh, LGBT community. I had a friend who is gay in Iran, and to, to exist in the way that he wants to, he has to go and seek these parties out. So there's a, there's a huge scale from the very relatively minor acts of rebellion to, to the quite major acts of rebellion. And Jake, what sorts of spaces are Iranians using to express their art? Um, there's a range of different spaces that I, I felt. Um, I obviously felt that the public space in Iran was quite sterile, occupied by mainly propaganda. But as you sort of move towards the private space, so cafes offer a space of freedom in certain parts of Tehran and certain parts of Esfahan, apartment blocks being the most sort of free areas, in my experience, because that's where I was invited to. Also, certain restaurants, things like um, the, the tombs of Sadi in, in Shiraz offered a kind of space of freedom and shopping malls, especially for young couples who wanted to sort of hold hands or, or walk in secret together. Um, Rosa, I just wanted to intercept here and, and talk about underground movements. And when we talk about underground movements, the word subversion comes up. I wanted to know how you define that. Uh, I don't know if we can define, I mean, if by subversion we mean an attempt to transform the, 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 the system, the established social order and the authorities and the order. I think very few words can be defined as subversive, except those who are very poetic and comes with talent and comes from real roots. For example, I know in terms of, uh, you talked of underground places, Iran, I don't know if we can call them a lot of galleries. Of course, you go to see exhibition or in flats, in private homes. Uh, but can we call them galleries? No. Can we see exhibitions? Yes. What is censored? Nakedness or political thing? But are these naked pictures interesting? I'm not so 100% sure. Are these political, overtly political opposition uh, say something that people don't know? I'm not 100% sure. But poetic works, yes. For example, if, uh, you know, uh, lots of poets from 10th century and probably before uh, when we quote Saadi, you went to the tomb of Saadi, or Hafez, or Rumi, mm -hmm. or any poet. Till now, all of them do, do think about, uh, talk about love, about homosexuality, about wine, about everything that it could be censored today. And yet, everybody quotes them, and you cannot censor it. Nor a Hafez, nor a Saadi, nor a Rumi, nor any of the great poets from Farrokh, uh, even in the contemporary term, Farouk uh, Farrokhzad, Sohrab Sepehri, Kia Rostami. You know, Korea Kia Rostami's uh, work, uh, the films, or the, his poetry, has nothing that is that looks as if you know it's aggressing the, the, the system or uh, creating. But he just shows that, okay, these, these homeworks that you're giving to my children and other children are rubbish. They don't co co correspond to any need or to any, uh, to any development, to any uh, positive contribution towards their culture. So this is, for me, the real subversiveness. It's a good work of art. It's a, it's a good reflection of what is happening and why are we in crisis? Uh, there are places of music, probably, you know, Bahman Gobadi, the Kurdish Iranian filmmaker who did this wonderful film five years ago called uh, Nobody Knows About uh, Persian Cats, mm -hmm. which was about the, the, the scene, the underground scene of music in, in Tehran, where all those, not only rap musicians, but mm -hmm. different, used poetry and text and melodies and, and instrument in order to express. and. Of course, it's a very small elite that can go to those parties. Let's be frank. I mean, not everybody yeah. can go to the parties. Not every flat is secure for them to go to that party. And Jake, you went to a few parties underground in Iran, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did. Uh, in fact, it was on the first night I was there. I'd, I'd gone not really knowing what to expect, and I'd gone with an open mind. Um, I didn't expect to go to a party where there'd be such a routine way of entering the party for a start. So we arrived in a car, which uh, was mixed gendered, and we had to walk separately from where we parked the car down to the apartment. Um, and then we had to go in through the door, and as soon as the door was shut, the music, the volume of the music was turned up, 
people started dancing. Of course, headscarves came off, hijab um, clothing mantos came off, so people were just wearing dresses, high heels, and then alcohol was served around, around the room. And the only time the music was turned down was when new guests arrived or, new, or guests were about to leave, and then the music was turned down so that the front door could be opened. But that was my first real taste of that sort of um, separate space, that private space in Iran. And from there, that I started to really notice it more and more as I was going along. But do you think that the authorities are aware of groups like this, underground parties? I think that they, they, I think they must be to an extent. I couldn't say for absolutely sure. Um, but they, they're so widespread, these, these actions, and on a daily basis as well. One of my friends, he said he goes to three or four parties a week if he can. Um, so it, they must be. They must be aware to an extent. It just must be impossible to really to really deal with it in the way that they would want to deal with it. I imagine. And in your blog, there's a quote: "Freedom too is punishable by death." What uh -huh. do you mean by that? That was a specific reference to um, one of my friends lost his friend during the Green Movement. He was shot by the Basij on the street. And that was something that he had told to me. He had. I was doing a, an interview of, of sorts in a, in a in a sort of restaurant in Iran, I'm not going to really mention where, um, and he was saying all that my friend wanted to be was to be free and he died. So I took this to mean that it was, a, it was a, our understanding in the West of freedom, something as simple as emancipation for someone who doesn't want to be in a country um, that oppresses them in such a way, or even just the call for democracy, the, the chant, where is my vote? So in that respect, freedom was punishable by death in, in the case of my friend's friend. Nathalia, um, in your you know, uh, research of Tunisia, how can you relate to that quote, freedom too is punishable by death? Does that hmm. echo with you? Yes, but in Tunisia, I think Tunisia is somewhat of an outlier um, in, in the sense that, and, and I've been, in the past in my writing, I've been critical of the idea of Tunisian exceptionalism because it's always been an excuse for a sort of orientalist projection on the rest of the region. But more importantly, it is somewhat of an outlier. Drinking is done openly there. Um, mm. Political discourse is everywhere. Um, there are several jokes about it. Some of them are not too kind, so I won't bring them up. But uh, freedom, too, is punishable by death. I think, yeah, in that sense, I think Tunisia is different. And I, I, I'm not sure it's a I'm sorry, I'm going to contest that quote okay. of uh, Jake. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't see, of course, uh, uh, I mean, these are very cliche uh, things that they say. Uh, uh, I, I, I haven't seen freedom being punished by that. Uh, of course, if people know that this is within the law, let's say if somebody shows overtly that let's say they are gay, they will be punished or they have uh, killed somebody. I, I, what, what do you call freedom? But that's I, the key, it's the openness and the public versus private. Uh, of you course, can do these it are the private. Yes. Of course, public. that is what, what uh, many, many uh, good philosophers, including Dayou Shaigan, who lives in Iran, has written books. It's called the schizophrenia of, uh, of uh, Muslim culture, where in, people like in Iran has a double life, the outside life and the inside life. But everybody managed to adapt to that. Unfortunately, of course, it creates schizophrenia mm. because you have this double nature. You, you, you know, uh, a child from childhood has to say to not to go and denounce his parents that they are drinking wine. I remember 20 years ago, uh, friends of mine were drinking wine in a cup of tea so that their kids doesn't report to them because you have to be even careful with your kids. Like Today, the these things do, don't yeah. happen. I don't yeah. think in schools they ask, do your parents drink or not, or they are punished to that. Uh, and Jake, you saw the, the double lives, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of, yeah. The, the person who I saw in most, I saw in almost everybody. I hung around mainly with um, young Iranian people. Um, the person who I saw in most um, was my friend who is gay in Iran. Um, he said that he has multiple lives. I mean, he has a relationship with a married man that obviously is a different life to the, relations, uh, to the, the life he projects in the public, walking around the square in, in Tehran or Esfahan, for example. And again, a different life in university where he doesn't want everybody to know he's gay. And again, a different life at home where fortunately his parents know that he's gay and they're okay with it. Um, but it's still very, very conservative. How does that sit with him? Well, he doesn't like it at all. He was one of these people who was telling me as well, why should he have to live like this? It's not, it's not a good thing to be able to adapt. It's, a human, it's, an, it's part of human nature to be able to adapt in the situation. But the question that kept coming up is why? 
why do I have to do this? Uh, and he still has to do military Europe, service. The issue was the same many, many mm -hmm. Well, thank ago. you, Jake. Thanks so much for being with us today. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're welcome. I thank think you. the issue of homosexuality, let's come back to it. I mean, mm -hmm. even in Europe was repressed. Even till now, I, I have European friends who are homosexual who don't dare tell either their parents or their friends or their bank. They are bankers and they cannot say to their office. So uh, let's not be that this yeah. is the main issue. It's not. It was an issue which was universal, where people could not go out that frankly the, it's not of course people can't get married if they are gay and so on we haven't reached that uh, type of uh, uh, freedom but, uh, but back to the arts I mean how daring and progressive is art in the Middle East I think it's quite a da daring and progressive you you, you, you talk about that? Egypt uh, Yacoubian building I mean it yes. is the writer is a dentist who write novel Ala Eswani and he wrote about homosexuality, about corruption, about he even did films with one of the youngest talent in Egypt, with the top actors and actresses of Egypt, and it was not censored. And it has all the all what somebody a Why tourist Why wasn't like, it censored? This is interesting. It should how, because the, you, how some you, some you, things are censored and some aren't. No, I, I think uh, I think if you come with a cliche in mind that freedom, you get killed for your freedom. Of course, if you want definitely to prove and to uh, provoke and, and to go against the system and you want to die as a martyr, you can die. But, but th there are many, many ways, there are nuances to everything. Uh, actually, uh, un, uh, you know, in some ways there are more gays, I would say, in the Middle East than there are in, in Europe because the culture is isolating the men and the women. And, and, and of course, so you, you go out with people that have the same culture than you or same sex. Uh, two men who go in the hotel yes. go more easily in Egypt or in Iran than, than maybe in Europe. Nathaniel, is the ability to avoid censorship an art form in itself? Absolutely. Absolutely. Not only to avoid censorship, but to walk the metaphorical tightrope, so to speak, between occasionally being censored, but still being able to exist in the open. So for artists did this well, um, musicians especially, whereas within cinema, I think people had to um, dress it up more in terms of allegories. But to go back very quickly, just the idea of sex and sexuality within Tunisia, um, on the three different taboos, uh, this um, really sex and sexuality, religion and politics. Sex, if you look at Tunisian cinema, was explored fairly openly. Yes. There's nude in the women. 70s, 80s, 90s. Yes, there's, there's um, Nouri Bouzid, exactly. I'm mm -hmm. thinking of Man of Ashes, where mm. two carpentry apprentices are, are, are raped by their, by their master. Um, and these things were uh, allowed to be explored. Now, I talked to uh, director uh, Munsef Dweeb, who told me, this was our breathing space. Um, there's the an cinema. idea. Uh, yeah, well, the idea of sex and sexuality. This was the one he told me he believes. And That's why is the that? to give people uh, an area to uh, be progressive and to explore themselves. Under Ben Ali and Bourguiba, of course, you didn't talk about religion. And if you did, it had to be along the state's lines. And you certainly didn't talk about politics unless it was via an allegory of sex. Mm -hmm. Um, Rose, do you think there's a s type of sensationalism attached to underground movements? Especially when it comes to buyers internationally, they want to buy art because it's kind of taboo and underground, as opposed to it's good art. Uh, yes, of course. I mean, I see lots of curators and lots of artists used to approach me and say, oh, Rose, we can't exhibit our work because it's a naked bodies and so on. I said, yes, but it's not good. If you want to do Naked Bodies, you have to compete with Lucien Freud. You have to compete with others. And if you're better and as good or different, you bring something to a Naked Body, then yes, we could exhibit you. But just because it's forbidden, that doesn't make an artwork. And many people ex exploited that. And lots of curators constantly tell you, oh, the veil, or they force the woman. Yeah. I say, you know, I'm all, the way I'm dressed now, I'm exactly how I'm dressed in Tehran. I only wear a scarf on the right. top, and the scarf falls often, and they don't say anything. But of course, the young ones can't defend themselves less than me. I have a protection of always being able to go out. But others who stay there, and they are young, and they are uh, maybe aggressed by a, a bully, uh, it's, a, it's a bullying uh, thing. But you know, uh, I think uh, an homosexual could be bullied in, in a small town in the USA. Uh, yeah. I don't think lots of people can express themselves as openly as if you are in New York or in San Francisco. Yeah. So it depends. Yeah. It's not sort of the regime 
uh, that, uh, as, as I yeah. told you, for example, because men should, it's okay for men to be together, it's almost easier for two men to live together than for, and two women to live together than it is for a couple uh, than in Europe, where maybe in some villages in, in, in small town Brussels or France or, or America, they will be seen very differently. Well, we've got to go over to the phone now. Uh, from Dubai is Sia, a graffiti writer based in Dubai. Sia, what made you move to Dubai to pursue graffiti writing? Um, I didn't move over for graffiti writing. I came over for, for work. Um, I was already a writer um, from London and from around the UK. Um, I came here for work and just kind of stumbled upon an area where there was, um, was graffiti, so I just kind of carried it on um, and then obviously started meeting a lot of other people. But uh, yeah, it wasn't something I intentionally came over here to do. It was just a, a thing that I was doing before okay, I so moved to Dubai. so you discovered it there. I mean, how censored do you feel as an artist there? Um, it's getting better. It's, um, it's nowhere near as, as bad as it was when I first came in. I mean, uh, Dubai is kind of a, is a new city, um, so it's very clean and very crisp, um, the main areas of it. So trying to make people understand what graffiti was all about um, has taken time, but it, it's, it's, it's getting there, it's getting better, um, but it's still a bit of a battle. That's an interesting dichotomy, graffiti and clean. Do they go hand in hand? Can they go uh, hand no, in hand? No. No, they don't go in hand in hand at all. But I mean, it, the way that, that the Middle East over here with graffiti is is handled is, I mean, if if they don't like it, they'll stamp it out instantly. So I mean, Dubai's too new and too clean, so it hasn't got a heritage of, of graffiti like London has, or like New York has, or like Berlin has. So it's it's graffiti as we know it was, I think, was brought over by the expatriates rather than than the locals. So yeah, Dubai is still is clean. There's not much street. Street yeah, because street on. art is born of an urban subculture. I mean, how, how compatible is this with a, with a region such as the UAE? Uh, I don't know. I mean, street art wouldn't exist if, you, if it wasn't for graffiti. So, I mean, that's just one of the points. But I don't know, really. It's, it's hard to try and describe it from, from living in Dubai, from living in London and then moving to Dubai and just seeing it, it being completely different. I mean... There's not really a scene here. As I say, the, most of the graffiti artists here are expatriates. They're you know from the UK, from the Philippines, from from wherever. But it's becoming it's becoming more acceptable, I guess. I think as a it, decorative a as a decorative mural, as opposed to like political messages. Yeah, I mean you'll always get the political messages. I mean, I mean, not in Dubai so much, but some of the other regions that I've been to, like Beirut and and places like that, there are a lot of political messages. And that was kind of their their take on graffiti, like the authorities. You know, they they think the graffiti is political messages and all that kind of carry on, mm. whereas it's more of an art form. So it was, you know, trying to get it across to to people that there is a difference between you know political slogans and the art form that that we do. So it's 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 a battle trying to trying to make people understand it and educate people on 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 the laws not the laws but the, the ethics of graffiti and straight art. And what's your take on that, Rosa? Well, I think graffiti? being in Dubai it must be very difficult for a graffiti artist. I know Dubai quite well. I go almost on a yearly basis since 10, 15 years. Uh, I think all the buildings are new. It's expensive. It's rich. It's well surveyed. So he cannot prosper that much there because it is linked. Beirut, I can understand. Damascus, all the Tunis, because these are cities with abandoned walls, houses, bombarded places, um, uh, uh, bridges, and things like that. But Dubai doesn't offer that for us. So I, I wonder what he can do there. Uh, the Beirut, yes, I found and discovered, like in Cairo, in Beirut, small stances, wonderful stances political mm. slogans, uh, uh, beautiful things that are, you know, hidden in between streets mm. where, uh, uh, whether it's even the restaurants don't cover it, the restaurants nearby because they like it. Mm. It's almost Banksy made a fantastic effect on, not only in Palestine, but well, I, I think the, the, the knowledge of the existence of Banksy created uh, a whole new, uh, opened a whole new door for lots of young people with little mean except stenciling, which is a very easy technique of cutting out and you know spraying very mm. quickly and go. Mm. And uh, and this, I, I think, this is the the right street art for me, mm -hmm. which has uh, not only has beauty but has a message, has uh, uh, humor, a fantastic sense of humor. Very often, I haven't seen much graffiti art in Dubai, I must say. Well, Nathalia, what do you think about um, the street art in, say, Tunisia? 
that's offering many different messages politically or other messages? Oh, absolutely. Um, and I think it's an important part of political discourse. But I, again, I think it ties in completely with the other forms of art, whether we want to call them subversive or not. They're, they're in conversation with each other. And uh, perhaps more importantly, a lot of the artists um, hang out with each other. They do collaborative projects. Um, once again, I'll mention Monsef Duib opened up a new cinema. Uh, he had the outside of it painted by some of the more popular um, Tunisian uh, street artists uh, with us from Tunis. They came and they decorated the outside. So there's, they're very much in conversation with each other and forming various strains of political discourse. But Sia, you have collaborations in Dubai with other street artists, don't you? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, um, the way to get around the problem of there being no walls is that I built uh, a 40 metre wall in my back garden. Um, okay. So that all the other artists that um, either visit or uh, or friends can come around here and paint. And there's a few places around that have 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 done this. I mean, the thing that Dubai is lacking is is a public um, spot for for people to go and paint. You know, like the halls of fame that you get in London and stuff like that. But um, because I've been here for so long, people tend to know the wall that I have now in my backyard, and so I get emails and phone calls and text messages asking if they can just, if there's anywhere to paint, and can they come and paint the wall that's at, at, at my house? So yeah. I have collaborated with other people, but as it being on the street, there's, there's hardly anything, and if, if it is there, then it's kind of hidden away, and people don't really get to see it. You know, we have to find but like, do, do a Do you not find that a shame? Do you... Oh, yeah, for sure, yeah. for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's... Dubai claims to be, and I love Dubai, I mean, I've been here for nine years, so, and, I, and I love the place, but sometimes they're a bit backwards in coming forwards, if you know what I mean. It's, mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's but for a shame me it that sounds like mural decoration. Yeah. Well, what do you think of the, the latest Banksy work uh, in Gaza? Just wanted to know your take on it. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't like Banksy stuff. Well, honestly, to be fair, I mean, that's, that's, that's that. She's the best artist Britain has. <laughs> well, thanks so much, I mean, Sia. Thank you. Sorry? Thank you for joining us today. No problem. Uh, the, what, what I appreciate a lot, for example, I wanted uh, on Tunis to mention a young man called El Cid. El Cid doesn't do anything what you call subversive or underground. It's very calligraphical, it's very beautiful. But what he does, the subversiveness of it, is that this guy goes in the middle of nowhere, deserts, abandoned villages, towns that are really depressing, that never heard about artwork. And he embellishes with beautiful calligraphical works that you haven't seen. And I think this is subversive, to bring beauty and art to totally desperate towns or villages, abandoned sites, and enlighten the people, bring a smile to their face. And I find that joy, that uh, gratuitous and generous act of embellishing things, because this is embellishing your own garden is one thing, embellishing your friend's garden is, is really dec a mural decoration for me in some ways. But to embellish and to do something that is unique that can disappear. That actually, nobody is actually covering up his work. He goes to Beirut, he went to Damascus, he went everywhere. He was invited. I saw him in, in Kuwait. He goes in, 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 in abandoned areas where workers are, and he mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. makes that. It's out of generosity, out of kindness. People do work that doesn't bring them a penny, and which brings a lot of joy and, uh, and the wonderful also reference to their own culture in, and, in that um, case. And I really admired El Cid for that. Nathaniel, in what ways does the press convey the arts in the Middle East? I think it, it ties back to the question you asked earlier about the sensationalizing of subversive arts. And it's not just the press, because it happens within academia as well. Um, I think 25 years ago, Leila Abu Lugold wrote uh, Romancing Resi Resistance, where she basically said we have a tendency to glorify uh, the human spirit and its refusal to be dominated. And this drives us to identify resistance in everyday expressions. But there is a certain tension that I feel about that, because you can say something in a cafe, you can make a joke, and that might not mean anything until you're arrested. Mm. Then does it become resistance? So how is it conveyed by the press? I think it very much mirrors this process. It does sensationalize resistance, and by that I mean it privileges a certain type of resistance. We're talking about young, middle class or above, secular. What about Islamic resistance? Mm. This doesn't really factor into the press's conversation. And do you think artists that go underground, um, I mean, is this a a rebellion, an act of rebellion, or more self-preservation? Hmm. Suppose it could be both. 
um, artists that go underground? Yeah. It's a difficult question. I'm sorry. Do you have a take on that? Uh, I don't know many artists who go underground because I think you can express contrary to what the one part of the paradox of all this contradiction inside out is also the fact that, in fact, you can say whatever you want to say. You just have to find the right expression or way of saying it. Uh, the, and mm -hmm. you, you see, for example, I knew you talk about why not the Islamists have it, but they were in London alone. I remember 30 years ago, one of the, some of the best artists, you know, Ahmad Mustafa, uh, Ali Omar Hermes, Libyan, very religious people. But for example, Ali Omar Hermes was a Libyan artist, lives still in London and so on. They, it, refused to write in the Quranic. He only wrote one letter, and from that you have to say la, for example, no. But then the no was the first, uh, the first letter for, to say la ilaha illallah. There is no God but God. So it was, uh, this, this was subversive for the time where everybody was very anti-religious, and this is a religious person. I would do openings and he wouldn't come because I'm serving wine, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and I respected that. I respected the fact that he stand by his own uh, criterion, by his own moral uh, thing. That's fine. I think we have to have be more democratic, whether it was, was the Islamists or others, because there are people with different opinions, but they have to respect us and we have to respect them. I think this, this is the, where communication can happen. So and it's, it's respect and the arts. Uh, I, think, I think, yes, respect of the diversity, respect of the, uh, all the alternatives that are there, and how can we put a dialogue between all these people, different, different types of people, you know. Uh, I know, for example, a girl from Sharjah, a wonderful artist, Karima Shomali, who, who veils herself, who comes from a very religious uh, family, who has children, and nevertheless, her husband, with this very conservative from Sharjah, they are not rich mm -hmm. because everybody thinks anyone who is from the Gulf is rich, not rich, from a very modest background, comes and studies for a whole year after having two sons, a husband and a father and so on, and she portrays them all silence in her, in her work. You know, the mouth is closed, whether it's her sons or her father and herself, and it's not censored. I mean, I think this is subversive. A woman with her, who doesn't shake hands, she comes to my gallery, people come constantly, oh, this is Karima Shomali. She doesn't shake I respect that. I respect the fact that people have their own beliefs, faiths, and also their own, they use their own talents to say things that maybe if somebody else said it would have been censored, but because it comes from her, it's even more powerful. Right. Um, and uh, Nathaniel, do you think artists are braver in the Middle East than in the West? It's difficult to, to generalize, but I would say in a lot of situations, yes, and in fact, the artists have to be, and I would even go further and say a lot of times they're more creative and sophisticated in the ways that they negotiate the structures that are put upon them, whether it be the patronage networks, censorship, co-optation. They very much um, find ways in a complicated situation to make their voice heard. Now let's explore how much a catalyst creativity is for change in the Middle East and what shifts are occurring in the region. Rose, how are women portrayed in the Middle East in the arts? Uh, as, as variedly as they are portrayed in Portuguese, Brazilian, English and other arts, really the variety of way they are expressed is very, very different. I mean, uh, if they want to be figurative, of course, if they want to do portraits, they have to do it with hair, with, with veil or without veil, and all of these things exist. I think the diversity of expression is, is absolutely endless. Plus, in the Middle East, what is the Middle East today? You know, a lot of our artists live outside the Middle East. Yes. But they are part of the Middle East. Yeah. For me, the world is one. I mean, an artist, Emona Hatoum in London, or Shiraz Hushari, or Shirin Nishat in New York, is still part of the Middle East, because their work talks about the Middle East. And, and their concerns is about the Middle East, even if they are outside. So 
it doesn't matter, and I, they are not under the restriction of put the veil on, don't talk about religion. They do talk about all these things, and they don't talk about it. I mean, Shirazi Hushari is more interested in mystical uh, concern, in Sufi poetry, Shirin in Shirin uh, Neshat, Neshat in, in, in contemporary right, women writers and poets. For example, her film, uh, Women Without Men, was inspired from a novel by, by a feminist uh, Iranian mm -hmm. novelist. Her uh, portraits of women of Allah, which had writings, were by Furukh Farouza, the feminist filmmaker and great poet of Iran who died in the 60s. So have you seen a shift over, say, the past 30 years of, of women expressing their identity? How, how has that been changing? I think it has been changing because women have more to say. Today, actually, the real force They have is, more to say or they, they have, have the to freedom say. to say more? Uh, the freedom, they are taking it. I think uh, in this day and age when the internet is king, because anyone who's censored can send their books, their photographs, their film, their music through internet to anyone. So in reality, the censorship is useless. Therefore, if you have something to say, you can say it and you can export it and somebody will get it. And if you Google who are the best curators on Middle East or Iran or on this subject, you can find them very easily. So I find today's censorship is totally um, uh, the word, French word, is desué. It's, it's non-functional. Non mm -hmm. It doesn't function yeah, anymore. Further and say that it, not only is it, you said, useless, but in fact, it's counterproductive. A lot of times it can bring attention to an artist. Yes. And, and in that sense, being... Do they not want that? Oh, the artists do, yeah. but uh, the, the person or government entity that's doing the censoring. Right. Um, one has to wonder, with this pattern being somewhat... I would say even obvious at this point, maybe they do. <laughs> I, I, sometimes you wonder why would you censor an artist if it's going to bring such attention to them. Mm -hmm. Right. Actually, some of the artists are getting, for example, Epanohi, who is in house arrest, did the film because this is not a film. Yeah. So the, everybody showed that film, of course. Yeah. And of course they said, how comes? And they put the poor cameraman who visited him. He said, well, I'm, I'm just in my home, can't I? Everybody has a mobile phone. I mean, you can do films with mobile phone. I mean, the fantastic technology that we have today, the, the use of mobile phone or video works. I mean, any small camera can do a fantastic video. You put it on your net, you go to any cafe and you can export it. So the, the, reason, the, the, the issue of censorship is no longer an issue. Well, how has the internet helped artists hmm. in, say, Tunisia? Well, it's not just the internet. I'd start more generally. It's, it's, it's numerous technological changes. Um, people are no longer shooting, uh, a, a large amount of artists are no longer shooting film on 35 millimeter film. They're shooting digitally. They're editing digitally. They're using GarageBand and Fruity Loops for making hip hop and different types of music. And also using the internet and different other uh, mechanisms in order to distribute their works. So it's, it's changed distribution as well. It's, it's, it's changed the field in, in, in many ways. There are today actually many books and publications about art and the internet, art and the new technologies. And uh, the use of that technologies, I mean, uh, craft work started at 50 years ago, but today all the musicians are using those computer uh, rising and the images, as you said, uh, today, uh, I, I wanted to do films 30 years ago. It was very difficult. The cameras were heavy. They think, now today the cameras are so easy. I have one young kid who is 24, just graduated from a film school, who is doing all my films, all the interviews with the artists, and the next day he comes 24 hours later, he's edited, the music is put, it's fantastic. So the technology has, has given that facility to anyone to do good films. But also exposure to the world. And exposure, you put it on YouTube, I'm putting all the short films on YouTube and let whoever wants information get it, you know, because Really, you don't make much money about from books or for films and so on, unless you're Coppola. And even Coppola, you lost a lot of money on other films. He made money on, let's say, The Godfather, mm -hmm. but he lost on any other film that he liked to do. He lost a lot of money, millions and millions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if Kiarostami doesn't make his money out of his film, though he's the most important, people almost kiss his hands in Japan and America, and he has millions of followers everywhere in Italy and in France. He makes his money by selling photographs for nothing. Um, just going back to, to women, I mean, it's illegal for women to perform solo in Iran. Um, yes. What um, is so threatening about that? Uh, I, I think because it can open lots of doors. Oh, of course, they perform. 
of course they perform. They perform in all the weddings. You go to the weddings even of religious people. That part of the room is women and the big hotels. These are men and there is a woman performing here and the man performing there. The performance exists. And I remember the first performances of women singers who came to London and they came first to London, Canada and the States because this is where they have the public. And it was fantastic. They, they didn't know if they should keep their scarf. Initially, they put a folkloric dress that was, had a sort of a scarf. And then little by little, the scarf went. And they, they were afraid. Some of them who came the first time here, I will not name names so that they are not, because they skipped on by. They didn't know. They came with the suitcase not knowing if they can go back. And of course, they, they managed to go back. They managed. And yes, of course, they went back. And this is, I'm talking of almost 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And now all of them are coming out and all of them are giving concerts and going back home and so on and so You're forth. Right. Okay. So there is no longer, uh, they cannot give concerts at home, that's true. But you know, where is home? Home is where you are. Mm -hmm. So if you're in Canada and your public comes in Canada, if they come to Royal, uh, uh, Royal uh, Albert Hall and Royal Albert Hall is full, this is the home of Gugush, this is the home of many, many singers because they have their clientele there and people were crying for those concerts. Nathaniel, I mean, how have women used the Arab Spring to their advantage to express numerous uh, things they want to say? I mean, what, what are <laughs> they saying? I think as, as a male and as an American, I'm not the best qualified to answer that <laughs> question. But if I may be like a politician and answer the question I want to answer, I'd like to go back to the technology real quick and correct what I was saying as well, <laughs> if it's okay. As technologies have changed, I don't want to be perceived as a technological fetishist because while there are new advantages to these technologies, there's also new limitations. And some old limitations that um, aren't as obvious I remember talking to a cinematographer who had borrowed a digital SLR to shoot an entire film. I said, wait a second, what did you do about lighting? As you know, mm -hmm. any studio, any film requires lighting. They, had, they still had to use old lighting or rather shoot for one hour a day in the perfect light outside, which made the filming process much more long drawn out. Mm -hmm. um, so there's still a lot of the old limitations. Nevertheless, I remember very correctly talking of Tunis, because Tunis is one of the most liberal Arab countries. Yeah. Bourguiba was the first uh, Arab leader who gave the vote to the woman, and so on. Uh, after that, Nasser in 56, but Bourguiba was the first. And I remember um, in, I think, I don't know the, the correct date really, it was in the late 90s mm -hmm. when the silence of the palaces by Mufida Tlatli uh, came out. I was the one here promoting her, her film, putting it in National Film Theatre, London Film Festival, ICA interviews, Channel 4. And then um, the um, BBC asked me, oh, uh, uh, I said, maybe we can do a, a documentary uh, on uh, women Tunisian filmmakers. They said, oh, yes, you can do about uh, Mufida. I said, Mufida is not the only one. There are like 14 women filmmakers that I know. Let's go there. Nadia Alfani. Uh, no, no. 14 on that documentary. Yeah, I I'm did. just naming And some. then they were trying, yes, they were trying to promote, there were a lot. So this we're talking of 20 years ago. Yeah. There were already some 15 well-known women film director. And BBC was so shocked. They said, oh, we have, we have to reduce it. We have to, we didn't know. Can you do about Arab uh, women? I said, if you cannot handle 14 in Tunis, how can you handle another 20 in Egypt? Or uh, the early producers of Egyptian cinema were all women. The, in, in the 20s and 30s and 40s. Well, joining us now over Skype is Delilah Victory, a dancer originally from Lebanon, but now living in Paris. Delilah, you were a dancer in Paris. How was your chosen profession viewed in Lebanon and even across the Middle East? Um, excuse me, Anna, I didn't hear you well, sorry. How was your pro profession as a dancer viewed in Lebanon and uh, across the Middle East, do you think? Well, it depend well, actually, um, there are two separate things, I think, in the Middle East. You have, like, uh, contemporary dancers who are, like, more um, individuals trying to, to make their own path with no finances whatsoever from the government. And you have the more traditional, like, entertaining business that has to do, like, with oriental dance and maybe um, some show dance or burlesque, something like, which is more, more recent. Um, I guess like the overall um, atmosphere in the Middle East is becoming more and more like reactionary and conservative like compared to what was in the 70s or even like cabarets where uh, I guess um, the, the woman's body were, was perceived maybe uh, in maybe in a different way. 
Um, so, uh, so it's more conservative now than 30 years ago? Yes, I have the feeling, absolutely. It's like maybe uh, it's more, um, I would say, like mainstream, where you would have, of course, like these video clips, you see it's like um, with, um, I mean, I would say like bimbos and like a very, uh, a very, um, I would say um, like s s sexy looking girls. But actually, like the atmosphere is more and more conservative because when you see like the censorship over like the body, the nudity, the the body expression, the desires, the the sexuality scenes. I mean, it's it is very strong in the Middle East. So, even though you might have the feeling that it is, uh, I'm talking like about Beirut case that mm. it's like very open and um, I mean, uh, I'm not sure. It's maybe it's just a facade, just an image. I, I'm not sure. Like the 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 real uh, the real thing is. Is, is becoming like more open and artists ha have more ways of, of expression, of course not. So there are quite a few contradictions there that you see in the performance world. Absolutely, absolutely. I see it like a bit of a society becoming more and more like schizophrenic or like split personality because as I recall it, like what my dad described, uh, how my dad described Beirut back in the 60s and 70s, apparently like there were like similar cabarets to what you could see, um, I don't know, in Paris, for example, like the Lido or shows like that. Whereas right now, I mean, nudity is completely forbidden in, in cabarets and um, also, for example, I think on, on theaters, uh, like for, for for example, in contemporary dance, I'm pretty sure it is uh, it is it is taboo right now in in the Middle East. Yeah. And in the wake of the Arab Spring, the Egyptian street art movement, for example, has been gaining momentum and and is exploring sexual stigma. Is this theme being explored Hello. in contemporary dance? Sorry, it's it was it was very cut. I couldn't hear your your question. No problem. I'll, I'll repeat it. Um, in the wake of the Arab Spring, the Egyptian street art movement um, has been gaining momentum and is exploring the theme of sexual stigma. Is this theme being explored in contemporary dance? Um, in contemporary dance in Beirut, um, maybe, I, I don't know, but uh, for sure, I mean, there has been uh, like uh, an uprise to, to like maybe the sexual repression that there is in the Arab world. I mean, people cannot not be aware of it and maybe what you can see in show business, I mean, all this appearance of like a, um, ultra like sexual women in a way is an expression of this frustration of this uh, body I would say frustration it's even more than just a sexual frustration and what are the main challenges for women in the Middle East when it, it comes to performing whether through art dance music well I would say that maybe um, the, the it's uh, of course I mean you have uh, maybe the the, the social more well, social pressure, I don't know, but I would say like finances, of course, like finding uh, people who would, who uh, there is absolutely no funding structure for, for like contemporary dancers or artists. I mean, there is no such thing as, uh, I don't know, like public theaters or mm. public companies or public dance companies. There, there is no such thing in Beirut. So it all has to come from a personal initiative. And uh, well, after and society, I mean, does it accept it? Doesn't it accept it? Because after all, it's, I mean, when you're an artist, you don't really, yeah. I mean, care about the, the, these matters. I mean, what's most important for you is to, to be able to find some fundings to, to go through with your work. Well, thank you, Delilah, for, for your contribution and sharing your views today. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Uh, Rose, two yeah, of course. about dancing. Uh, there are two issues. One, she mentioned in the, that her parents in the 50s, 60s, 70s yeah. said that it, Lebanon was much more liberal. We had the Casino du Liban. And of course, Casino du Liban is like Moulin Rouge. And you know, you have a beautiful woman coming from the West uh, and dancing with feathers and so on. It was very nicely decorated for a certain elite who, who was bored to that and who wanted to see that. But I think even at that time, a lot of women, young women of my generation and so on, we were not that keen on, 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 on these naked women entertaining old men, uh, frankly. So if it has disappeared, I don't see bad things about it. I mean, <laughs> maybe there is less option. But those who could go to Casino de Liban can go to Paris and can go to Lo uh, London and go to all the dingy places they want to go to see naked uh, women. They are 
tons of naked bodies now in pubs and for, for $5. So you think it was dis disrespectful? Uh, uh, I yeah. find as a, fe as, as, you know, I want, don't want to use even uh, feminist, but I think this was an entertainment for another generation, for older men with money. Uh, that has changed, and thankfully, for as far as I'm concerned. Now, the, the other thing is the belly dancing, which is a very beautiful traditional uh, Arab dancing. When you take the stereotypes out, for example, in Egypt, even 20 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, they started forbidding Arab women belly dancers to dance with their bellies showing. They had to cover up with, with a sort of a nylon or a transparent thing. So at the end of the line, who was dancing? The Hongay East European were the dancers in, in the mm -hmm. cabarets of Egypt. Just because as an Arab woman, you couldn't dance, but as a foreigner, they could dance, but with a little bit of uh, uh, transparent cover. I find that totally ridiculous because I think it's a beautiful dance. Every kid, every mother, every daughter, and all, all the gymnasts here, people who are uh, giving birth are there teaching me how to do belly dances so that to give better birth. So I think it's a, it's a beautiful dance and it's a beautiful part of our culture that mm -hmm. should not be uh, controlled by. But of course, also those cabarets at that time, I mean, when, when today you see a, a wonderful films of the 40s, 50s, 60s with Tahir Karyoka, Samir Gamal, these are classics. I, I remember showing them at NFT for the first time on big screen because all of us, even my generation, which is old, we saw it on television. And none of us really saw it on big screen with English subtitle. I, I, I ra raised the fund for subtitling in English at the National Film yes. Theater. And it was fantastic because you could see every muscle of the body of Samia Gamal, of Tahir Karyoka moving in, and no dancer in Europe could do that. So it was a, a contribution towards the academia of the dance, I would say, or even to the culture of dance. So it was a plus. Nate, how are artists combining uh, tradition and modernity in what you've been seeing produced in the, from the Middle East? Hmm. I'm very critical of the idea of tradition and, and, and modernity, uh, especially. Um, the idea of modernity, uh, I think they're both very problematic concepts. Um, but I would say in the contemporary period, it, sorry, I don't have an answer to that. Really? So you don't think they're, they're sort of bringing something of their past, of the, the generations previously, and combining it with what they want to say and expose to the world about it? Absolutely. Surely well, they think, don't abandon that. I, I, I'm, I'm somewhat uh, put off by the terms tradition and modernity, but I would say in the mm. contemporary period, and especially now, people are drawing on a durable past. And especially in Tunisia, where under... Bourguiba and under Ben Ali, it was denied to them. Um, they were told, you are like this. And yes, it was, there was a certain, if we want to call it secularism in loose terms, but it was also forced along the lines of um, Ataturk, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so there is, a, I would say, an effort perhaps to reconnect with the past, but whether it's tradition what, versus what modernity. Sort of past? The a past of long, long time ago? Or? I think for some it's, uh, it, it's more of... Um, geared towards an, uh, a more uh, quote-unquote Islamic lifestyle. Or for some others, it would be um, uh, other forms of living. Yeah. Uh, is there a change in generations? I, I think I, I deal mostly with artists. In the mm. creative world, if you want to be good and you want to be original, you can only be yourself, which means you cannot neglect your past. You cannot not refer I have no problem with saying tradition or something if that is tradition with your all your social background because you have you're part of it I mean we are all made of the past and the future and the present I mean and and what is what is important is is not to forget your your histories I would say the many histories, I mean, the, the contribution of uh, uh, Carthaginois from Elisar uh, to, uh, to Ottoman Empire, to uh, Christians, to Romans who brought the wine to Algeria and the region. All of this is part of the Tunisian, Algerian, Moroccan culture. It is part of it. And Islam. Islam is quite new. Uh, there are a huge Jewish community, whether it's in Morocco or, or, in, uh, or even Christian communities because of the colonies and so on. So I think all these elements and all these histories, all these different periods contributed, whether it was under colonies, under occupation, and so we're always under occupation of some sort. How, how you know? are communities, different communities, expressing themselves in, in Tunisia through arts? Hmm. I think much in the same ways. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, asserting themselves through different mediums and, and whatnot, but also it's, it's, uh, it's a difficult question. I mean, um, do, you, do you think arts are bringing communities together or actually it's more about the, the individual involved? Arts, if it was a, a cinema, a good film brings for people. For example, we mentioned Nuri Bouzi's Man of Ashes. We, there are many, many very good Tunisian films. Now, I don't want to cite just titles and names. It's, it's, it would be useless. But though, during that time where everybody went to the cinema, where seminar was a popular cultural media where with very little you could access story and associate with it and say, you know, this represents me. I suffer, so I'm not the only one, and so forth, so on. It was a fantastic area. I mean, I, I, I went to all those festivals of music. It was very popular. People from very poor mi milieu to the very rich milieu were sharing the same culture. And that was fantastic. In, it, this was true in, in Tunis, in some ways even in Egypt, because of the richness of the cinema culture and also because of the antiquities being next to uh, modern hotels and so on. So, so there wasn't that many contradictions. There, there was this sort of... You have to absorb it, and it takes time to absorb modern, yeah. you know, mo modern uh, concept. I mean, uh, even though, let's say, uh, we mentioned that there there were issues, whether it was about homosexuality, exploitation, yeah. tourism, the number of films in, in in Tunis or in Morocco who who managed to express the fact that there was this sex culture tourism. There were all the Europeans coming to have young men around. Yeah. I mean, that was done in the literature. We know it since many other writers that people did go to those countries for some permissivity that they couldn't have in Europe. Nathaniel, how um, has the atmosphere for artists differ for, um, for in pre-revolution to post-revolution in, in Tunisia? Hmm. There, there, in, in a lot of ways, there, it's miles apart, and in some, it's been slow to change. For instance, uh, censorship, while it still exists uh, in some forms, depending on who you ask and in any given case, the coercive elements like, such as censorship have been met with more transparency. Um, so when someone is silenced by the state, any branch of the state, we find out about it. And it, there's much more um, resistance to it, if you will. But I would say that because there's no commercial cinema, for instance, in Tunisia, as there is in Egypt or Lebanon or Iran. The industry is not as big. The patronage networks are still very much in place. And so if you have a script, it needs financing. Yeah. And so uh, in some ways, some of the strictures, uh, um, some of the issues faced by artists in making work are still very much there and are equally politicized. Funding for artists, Rose, mm -hmm. How for difficult that is in, in, in Tunisia. It's difficult even in Europe and America. Yeah. You can ask any filmmaker who wants to make their film. They, it's not easy to mm. fund a film. It's not easy to get an exhibition in any gallery. It's not easy to produce photographs and framing and having an exhibition and a book. So I, I think that the issue of funding is really not related to the Middle East alone. It's shared by all artists and filmmakers. Uh, I, I wanted to say that because in Tunisia, in fact, you do have lots of small producers. I used to see them in Berlin, coming to Berlin, to Rotterdam. And they get, in some ways, they are more privileged because there were funds for those countries who don't have things. And they could get from, from Prince Klaus Fund, from Rotterdam, from different uh, uh, funds that are available in different festivals from Cannes and elsewhere, funds to do their film. I think the whole... Uh, it's as difficult, believe me, for a French, even if mm. the French manages it's to get the funding, yeah. even you do the film and then who's going to distribute it? I remember I saw a very nice French film one day. I told uh, the director of the London Festival, I said, Sheila, it is a very good film. She looked and said, oh, no. So it never made it to the festival. And I said, oh, so the, a French film also can die, no matter how much people fought for two, three years before. But there before. is a huge difference between France and Tunisia pre-revolution in, in terms of finance and the arts. This was one of the main weapons, and I'm not just the only person saying this. This is yes. well documented. It was one of the main weapons of the regime, which was to, to silence artists. You don't have in France, I imagine, uh, people involved with the Ministry of Culture saying that my job is, and I quote, to put the culture to sleep. Um, so, so funding, I think, I yes, it's a problem, but culture. it's not as, yeah, not as politicized. But I, I will tell you one thing, the most uh, 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 successful commercial films were not done by only Tunisian funds. They were done really, when you look at the production at the end of the film, 
a lot of French, Swiss money, Dutch money, etc., etc. It was done by many European countries. I don't know today because I haven't seen any good commercial film for some time coming out of, let's say, Tunis and so on. Maybe because I'm out of the festival world. And, but I think that we are producing less because we have, people are concerned, you know, when you have a revolution and a war, you're concerned about money, about electricity, about water, about how to pay the, the fees for your kids and so on. So the priorities have changed. The priorities are much more practical at the moment than uh, especially doing a film or entertaining people, which is right. not an easy thing to do anywhere, anyhow. But it's true that there, there were more censorship, of course, in Tunis or in Egypt than there is in, in France or in Holland or uh, in, in Germany, for sure. Well, thank you. Um, well, the Middle East has always had a rich and multi-layered artistic culture, not without its contradictions. With the rigorous censorship laws in place across the region, it's true that artists have had to seek out underground spaces to create freely or adopt more subtle methods when expressing their thoughts through art than in the West. However, what is clear is that censorship may work on a superficial level, but it can never entirely work. Artists will never stop their quest for truth, no matter through what means. I'd like to thank all my guests on today's show, Jake Threadgold, Sia Graffiti, Dalila Victory, and of course my studio guests, Rose Issa and Nathaniel Monone. Thank you. Thank you. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>